Good evening and welcome. The Saratoga Historical Foundation presents archivist Dorothy Louie. This is highlights of the history of the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Well. So I'm going to ask you to please turn off your video and your microphone because this event is being recorded. And if you have any questions during the event, please please press chat for asking questions and we'll answer the questions after the e lecture. So thank you. Once again, please turn off your video and your microphone. Today's presentation is being sponsored by the Saratoga Historical Foundation. And the mission of the Saratoga Historical Foundation is to preserve the rich history of Saratoga for the education and enjoyment of the community. And that means everyone. So if you came to the, her to the historical um, area, you would have, uh, you would see our museum. It's in a 1904 building with information about Saratoga's history. You'd see a furnished 1850s pioneer cottage. You could go inside a one-room schoolhouse and take your photo. And if you want to find out about more events, go up to www.saratogahistory.com. Our next event is going to be a new exhibit called Ask Your Grandmother, May 20 through August 28. Also, as part of Preservation Month, we are offering a free walking tour of historic Oak Street on May 28th at 1 p.m. and May 29th at 1 p.m. led by a docent. I know you'll enjoy this. It'll take about an hour and a half. You'll meet in front of the museum at 2450 Saratoga Las Gatas Road in Saratoga. For more events, go up to www.saratogahistory.com. This lecture series has been recorded and is posted on www.saratogahistory.com. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. She serves as the archivist and records manager at SLAC, as well as the manager of the SLAC Research Library. Her previous experience includes working at the Life Sciences Data Archive at the NASA Ames Research Center. She earned degrees from MIT, University of Michigan, and San Jose State University. So please join me in welcoming Dorothy. Thank you so much, Annette, and thank you all for uh, your time. I hope this will be an informative and interesting presentation for you. And I just want to apologize ahead of time as I'm not a historian or a physicist, but um, hopefully um, it'll be an enjoyable time for us. Um, let me share my screen. Can you all see this? There we go. Oh, great. OK, so this will be just a really brief um, history or highlights from our 60 year history. Um, oh, sorry. Excuse me. Try that again. Uh, sorry, I hit the wrong button. Um, so uh, I'll start with an introduction of uh, Slack and who we are and uh, what we do, and then I'll go into um, uh, history highlights. So first of all, I wanted to share a really brief video um, that the archives worked with our um, videographer in communications with. Um, his name is Olivier Bonin and our senior archivist, Jean Deacon. It's a really brief video. There's no audio, um, but I thought it would be something um, neat for you to see. Um, it's not been published, so you'll have a sneak preview. Um, let me switch really quick. So. So here, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So you'll see um, the, the landmark uh, from the 280 freeway. So the archives worked in getting some imagery and historic photos um, for this video. And in, late, in the late 1960s, Stanford University physicists um, first um, got together to plan the building or construction of the accelerator. Here are some of the physicists that were involved. Right, yeah. And one 
thing to note is um, the Highway 280 uh, overpass was built before the actual highway in order to in, um, make sure that the alignment wasn't, um, uh, that the escalator could get built without messing up with the alignment. And then you can see an animation here of accelerate, uh, electrons going through the accelerator. Right here, I need to Thank you all for um, humoring with me, letting me share that with you. I'll go back to the main presentation. Uh, so I wanted to um, provide a more a greater introduction to Slack. Um, Slack is actually um, from our beginnings, constructing a linear accelerator that was dedicated to high energy physics. Um, we've transformed into a multi-purpose research facility that spans several fields, which I'll get into later in the presentation. Um, just a brief um, note about our name. The uh, Slack National Accelerator Lab was, um, it, the name itself pays homage to the legacy of the lab and its connection to both Stanford and the Department of Energy. Um, we were formerly or first named Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, but the name lab's name has changed in 2008 as we underwent a shift from our focus on part of the physics to a broader multi-program research facility. And so just to orient you a little, you can see the accelerator in the background here, and then it branches off into the research yard here where there's all the um, buildings like the end station A and B and some of the rings here, which I'll get into later as well. So as I mentioned before, the National Accelerating Laboratory signifies um, Slack's role as one of the 17 DOE um, national labs, which are represented by these orange dots on our map. Um, uh, so DOE actually contracts the operations for Slack to Stanford University, and they also provide oversight. Uh, one thing to note is that Slack has um, a great deal of partnership with Stanford University. There's several joint institutes and centers which are represented here. Um, I'll get into a few of them um, towards the later part of the presentation. But one thing I did want to highlight to you is in the left corner here, um, on the bottom is a, a, a image of the uh, the Large Synaptic Survey Telescope, which has been named uh, for the Rubin Observatory that's being built in Chile. Um, it's one of the largest digital, it is the largest digital camera that's built. It's about five and a half by nine and eight tenths feet um, and 6,200 pounds. It's huge. Uh, and it provides uh, 3.2 gigapixels. And uh, just again, uh, some of the science that goes on here at Slack, um, uh, there's a depiction of uh, chemical processes like here, um, photosynthesis, as well as material science, um, connection with astrophysics and um, high energy density science field here, as well as um, biology with a model or structure of the RNA. And also notable is that we did help support a great deal of COVID-19 research in the last year or two. Um, and here's an example of the experimental station at one of our facilities. We were also home to several Nobel Prize winning research projects. Um, separated here um, in the early ages of Collider as well as later synchrotron and X-ray research. And I'll get into some of this um, later in the presentation. Um, these are primarily the Slack and Stanford uh, staff that were awarded Nobel Prizes here. Um, and then briefly, um, the Archives History and Records Office is where I work. Um, and we work to find and appraise records of historical value and organize, preserve all that material and assist researchers, which includes the public um, and um, not just um, people in official research capacity. And we provide uh, intellectual capital, uh, for example, compiling uh, accurate historical timelines of events and um, doing presentations like this. And um, our, the URL for our history website is, is listed at the bottom and it's, I'll show it at the end as well. So now to the uh, main part of the presentation, um, I just tried to select some images from like a decadal survey across our history and um, hopefully it'll give you a nice flavor for what's been happening in our in our history and some of the events and um, projects that go on here. So first the 1960s, 
1962 is when we were founded. Um, Stanford uh, signed the slack construction contract for $114 million. You can see um, the gentleman here pictured standing is Panof uh, Wolfgang Panofsky, who is our founding director. He was also a Stanford physicist. And um, he's presenting to the board of trustees. And then on the right, you can see that they're signing the contract. And um, in the background are aerials of Slack. Um, in terms of our leadership, along with Panofsky, who was our first director all the way through 1984, is our first deputy director, Sid Drell, who was also a Stanford connect, had Stanford connections as well. Um, he started in 1969 and uh, served until 1998. And notably, they were both arms control experts as well. Here are a few select photos of the many, many photos we have of, ex of the excavation and construction of Slack. Um, so you can see um, some excavation going on on the left. And in the middle here in the very background, you can see the 280, the 280 highway overpass, as well as all the large cranes. And um, the, this is the branching off in the research yard. And then here on the right, you can see the accelerator housing is um, being constructed 25 feet underground. Later on, there'll be backfill and earthfill. And the Klystron building gallery, which is what you see when you're going on the highway, will be built right on top. And that houses all the utilities and, and, and um, accessory equipment. And then just on the bottom, I just wanted to show a close up again of the highway um, overpass over the Klystron building. So uh, after, it took about four years for the construction since the founding in 1962 and to get us up and running. And here you can see in 1966, Panofsky is giving a tour to um, uh, the Atomic Energy Commission staff as well, probably Stanford staff as well of the accelerator. And um, let's see, let's go counterclockwise. Uh, on the bottom here is the AC uh, field, uh, director who was uh, pictured during the golden bolt ceremony which commemorated the last bolt being placed in the linear accelerator in February 66. And then you can see Panofsky and um, other staff and researchers who are celebrating in May 21st 1966 when the first beam appeared in the accelerator sector. And then um, on the bottom here I also wanted to highlight that there's quite a computing history as well at um, Slack as, and um, uh, here is the transfer of the IBM 36075 main to Slack in 1967. There is quite a deal of computing power that we needed to analyze all the research results. Um, one of the few, uh, one of the first um, experiments or research programs was the, the, sorry, the bubble chamber experiments. And here's an example of one of the bubble chambers. Um, on the top tier here is all the computing and controlling equipment. And the bottom is the bubble chamber where um, this gentleman is standing. Um, and in the middle is just a, a representation of um, all the kind of equipment needed to review the scanned films of the bubble and chart spark chamber events. And then this is an actual um, right image of a bubble that captures a bubble chamber event. Um, this was uh, in particular from 1968 and 69. Um, sorry for the background noise. Um, the bubble chamber experiments were actually um, conducted with superheated liquid that boils in a, uh, into tiny bubbles of vapor on ions that are produced along tracks of subatomic particles. So you can see um, as the experiment goes on, uh, the, uh, the person who's monitoring the experiment would take a small portion of the events, usually about one in 30, to record on photographic films, which could, which could then be analyzed later. Um, as the program amped up, it uh, ended up taking about 7 million pictures in 1971. So there's quite a great deal of volume of um, data. And as I mentioned before, uh, in the research yard, there were quite large facilities as well. Here's interior of end station A, and you can see the spectrometers that were used for the experiments. And you can see down here, um, gentleman in a white shirt, so you can see for scale how large the equipment was. And then uh, coupled with um, the spectrometers are also all the computing equipment that are located in the control room. Again, quite a deal of machinery and computing power. 
one of the first scientific uh, discoveries at Slack was actually a fossil of a prehistoric um, marine mammal. Um, it was first named Paleoparadoxia and later renamed uh, Neoparadoxia. Um, here you can see Adele Panofsky at the center. She's the wife of our founding director and she spent a great deal reconstructing the fossil. Um, here is just a model of the fossil and she's uh, displaying or sharing with um, UC Berkeley staff. Um, the fossil itself is now housed at UC Berkeley's um, paleontology department or museum. And here again is um, Adele working on a model that was later displayed in our visitor center um, for quite some time. Um, this model has been put on loan with the San Mateo um, History Association Museum in Redwood City and they're pending um, the the construction and funding of another wing to their museum before they can display it. And I lastly, I wanted to show you for the 1960s a, a excerpt of some of this our staff members at work. Um, in 1962, we grew, we started off with about 400 staff and um, spanning multiple disciplines. So you can see, for example, there's um, construction and machinery and assembly, as well as scientists, both theorists and experimentalists. And again, um, a lot of uh, computing scientists as well. So that brings us to the 1970s. November 1974 was known as the November Revolution for the um, spurt, the growth and spurt of uh, really great physics discoveries. So here you can see the research group C who are um, pouring over uh, research data. Um, and on the right here is a scroll. Um, I believe that wooden scroll was built by um, Marty Breidenbach who's pictured sitting down here. And you can see the peak. Um, from when they discovered um, the Desai particle. And then um, below it is pictured the actual research logbook, which um, was actually, a, a, an image was taken that and then it was uh, incorporated in the Smithsonian's Atom Smashers Discovery uh, Experiment, sorry, exhibit in 1977. Um, another project that Slack was SPEAR, or if short for Stanford Positron Electron Accelerating Ring. It's a machine at Slack that was completed in 1972. Um, as you can see, there's a single ring um, about 80 meters in diameter, and it has counter rotating beams of electrons and positrons that collide with each other. And here's a picture of the groundbreaking ceremony for the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Project, which was later renamed to Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source, and that was in 1977. Um, uh, the name change uh, happened later in 2008. Another project that happened in the 1970s was the Positron Electron Project, or PET for short. Um, you can see Grant, Alan uh, Cranston uh, with the shovel here at the groundbreaking ceremony, along with Panofsky on the left. Um, and then there's also a picture of the town excavation in 1978. And then near the completion in 1979, you can see the interior of the storage ring tunnel with all the components. And at the the very bottom, you can see the pet magnet group that's gathered to celebrate the completion of the last bending magnet for the ring. Um, one of the gentlemen had his hand in a cast, but needed to be part of the, the group photo. Um, again, um, during the PEP excavation, there was another fossil, uh, there are other fossils recovered during this um, excavation. Um, here in particular, um, is a uh, picture one of the fossils, um, which is a cross section of a cervical vertebrae and fragments of other vertebrae from a whale. Um, and that's about 21 inches long. And on to the 1980s. So you can imagine um, that there's quite a bit of large machinery involved in uh, constructing um, our facility. Um, here are a few examples. On the left is the high resolution spectrometer or HSR, 
sorry, HRS magnet that was moved from the Argonne National Laboratory to SLAC in 1979. And the two um, photos on top on the right are depicting this crystal ball detector um, shown in 1978. And um, notably, the eta C particle was discovered with this crystal ball detector in 1980. And then you can see in 1982, it was loaded onto a US Air Force cargo airplane at Moffett Field on its way to Germany in uh, yes, 1982. And at the very bottom, you can see that uh, there's a ship uh, passing under the Golden Gate Bridge in 1987. It's loaded with 2,500 tons of disassembled steel for one of the detectors that was um, built to slack specifications later. And it was designed by um, Kawasaki Heavy Industries in Japan. So PEP operations began in 1980, and in 1984, um, Panofsky officially retired, but was still involved with the lab, but Burton Richter became director. And you can see a really dark, sorry, picture of Burton, Dr. Richter, and there's a PEP tunnel image behind him. Um, also in the 1980s, um, uh, here is a picture of a signing ceremony in 1985, commemorating the US-Japan collaboration on high energy physics. Um, just a, it's just a brief example. There are quite a few international visitors at Slack throughout the years. Um, unfortunately, didn't have time to put in all the pictures, but um, some examples are in 1970, we hosted French President Pompidou. Um, we also hosted several um, delegations from China, the first in 1972, as well as the Jap Japanese Emperor and Empress in 94, as well as the Princess of Thailand in 2000. Um, the next few projects that happened were the Stanford Linear Collider, or the SLC, and the Mark III detector. So on the left here, you can see a schematic. Um, at the start of the accelerator, there's an electron gun. It goes through the downing rings, down the accelerator path, into the rings, and um, there's a schematic of the detector here, and then the actual photo of the detector um, with, the, with the scale, so you can have a sense for how large it is. Um, so the SLC project became operational in 1989. It consisted of extensive modifications to the original linic or linear accelerator to accelerate the electrons and positrons in opposite directions about um, a 2000 foot ring of loop of magnets. Um, the increased collision energy led to more precise uh, determinations of the mass of the C particle, which is a neutral carrier of the weak force that acts on fundamental particles. And now we're on to the 1990s. Uh, notably, the first web browser in North America was actually at Slack. Um, Paul Kuntz, whose picture here, had visited CERN, and um, he brought the World Wide Web browser to Slack in September 1991. This photo, though, was taken in 1998. Sorry. And then there's also another um, picture of some of the Slack WWW Wizards who visited Paul in his office in 2000. On the left is our longtime librarian, Louise Addis. So um, interestingly enough, um, the motivation for bringing the web browser was for international researchers to have access to preprints in our library. And we actually have the next machine on display in our lobby if you ever have a chance to stop by. Uh, there are a couple of Nobel Prizes that were awarded in the 1990s. First was for Richard Taylor, along with his colleagues, Henry Kendall and Jerome Friedman from MIT. Um, this was actually um, for experiments that were conducted in the early 1970s, about the same time as Richter's experiments, but it took uh, quite a while before um, before the scientific community could recognize the importance of their discovery. Um, in their deep and elastic scattering experiments in the end station with those large spectrometers I'd shown you before. Also awarded a Nobel Prize in Physics was Martin Pearl in 1995 for the discovery of the tau lepton. And here's a picture of all three Nobel laureates. Uh, and finally, in 1990s, um, there was also the next linear collider Test Accelerator, or NLCTA. Um, there is a collaboration with the KEK director from the Japan, uh, Director General Sugara Warasan. And then there was also the PEP2 project. Um, 
So PEP2 is an upgrade of PEP. Um, it was dedicated, as you can kind of see in the picture there, in October 1998. Uh, you can see Jonathan Dorfin, who is the director, who assumed directorship after Burke. Burton Richter, as well as Connalisa Rice and Bill Richardson on the left there. Um, so PEP2, just to give a brief if, in their, um, sorry, overview, is two independent storage ring, one on top, which is a high energy ring, electron beam, which is an upgrade of the existing structure, and then a low energy ring, positron beam, which was new. Um, that was um, coupled with a Babar detector. Um, B factory is the popular name that was given for this asymmetric um, or colliding beams of particles with unequal energies to produce um, B mesons or subatomic particles. And let me show you a picture. Um, so these are two detectors. One was the Sanford, uh, the Slack Linear Detector, or SLD, as well as the Babar detector. Um, just more on Babar. Um, it was an international, or still is, an international collaboration for particle physics research. And there's actually been over 500 publications over the years, um, including a 2008 Nobel Prize in Physics for work on high precision measurement of C CP violation that was conducted at SLAC and awarded to Japanese researchers. And the name Babar actually came for kind of through the name uh, for the search uh, for B and B bar particles. So that's the name Babar. <laughs> And I just wanted to go over a really brief survey of the 2000s since it's um, a little bit more recent. Um, here's the SPEAR-3 upgrade that um, was completed in 2004. SPEAR-3 is a 3GV high brightness third generation storage ring that operates with high reliability reliability and low emittance. Um, you can see a colorized version of the exterior on the left here and the interior on the right. We also, as I mentioned, uh, are involved with astrophysics as well. Um, it's first started, this project first started as GLAST, the Gamma Ray Large Area Space Telescope, which was renamed to FGSG or the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope um, after the tradition of NASA renaming projects once they're launched. So um, here's a picture here of the Large Area Telescope, which is a array of um, kind of like a detector array. Um, it's about 1.8 1, 1 meter cube size in size, and that's the main instrument for the telescope. And in the middle, you can see um, it's loaded onto the rocket. And then on the right is the artist's conception of it in space. Um, from the NASA website, um, it describes the launch uh, as occurring on June 11, 2008, and it was renamed in honor of Professor Enrico Fermi, who was a pioneer in high energy physics. Uh, following along the line of astrophysics is the Cali Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology, or CAIPAC for short. Uh, here on the left is the CAIPAC, or the Cavley building that was dedicated in 2006. And then there's a composite of galactic simulations of visualizations that represent some of the um, experimental work and research that goes on. Um, CAIPAC was established in 2003, and um, it's still um, active and, um, yeah, it's still active and current. We also have another joint institute called SIMES, or the Stanford Institute for Materials, Energy, and Science. Uh, it's the main aim of SIMES is to study uh, the nature, properties, and actions of complex and novel materials, um, both on electronic and atomic level, and to apply that to cleaner, renewable energy resources and technologies. Um, on the left is one of the researchers with the equipment in 2007. Uh, in the center is a picture of a magnet in 2000, or battery, sorry, in 2008. And then um, on the right are Slack senior scientist Mike Tony, um, who's in the purple polo, and a Slack Stanford's postdoctoral researcher, um, Alex Asner, with a piece of thin film photovoltaic material. Um, 
so here is a picture that kind of summarizes a lot of the projects and how they fit into the structure um, from 2006. At the far end is the um, electron gun where it starts in, and then there's damping rings. And then you can see the branch off and the research yard to the different facilities. And then um, our most recent construction project is LCLS. So LCLS is a linear coherent light source. It's our mission, our primary mission, um, our flagship mission, I guess. Um, we first got, achieved first light in April of 2009. Here's a representation from um, our computing equipment. And uh, on the right is a picture of the undulator hall. Um, the undulator hall houses um, a lot of quadrupoles or magnet arrays or assemblies that um, help to um, guide the beam. So uh, the LCLS was dedicated in 2010. It's an X-ray free electron laser or FEL. It takes X-ray snapshots of atoms and molecules um, uh, as, as uh, at work, and it provides atomic resolution to a detail at ultra fast um, time scale. So you can reveal different processes that are in the materials, technology, and living things. These snapshots can be strung together into molecular movies that show chemical reactions and biological processes as they happen. Um, both LCLS as well as the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope were named Breakthroughs of the Year by the Science Magazine editors in 2009. And notably, LCLS also received the DOE Award of Excellence in 2011. And we're currently going through the LCLS to upgrade um, to cryogenic uh, levels. Um, so that was a really brief survey of our history. I wanted to point you out to um, resources, uh, in particular our 60th anniversary website. Um, officially, I believe it'll, it's, it'll, I guess usually, usually it gets uh, celebrated in the fall timeframe um, or August, late summer timeframe. There's not a particular um, event, unfortunately, this year, but there has been a website that's set up. I did want to point you to several, a couple documentary films there that are really great. Um, we were able to, we were contacted by the producer of one of these films that, um, that was made in the 60s, and we were able to, um, to uh, produce a higher quality version of it and post it, and it's uh, included on the website. There's also an interactive virtual tour that you can take. Um, uh, while we used to have uh, bi-monthly public tours, but I'm not sure when those will resume again. But in the meantime, I really encourage you to take a virtual tour. It's uh, really well done. And then finally, um, other resources I'd like to point you to is uh, our website, the archives website. We have a host of features, including histories and um, uh, with resources and bibliographies, as well as oral histories from much of our researchers and administrative staff and leadership, as well as short features and biographies, as well as um, an online exhibit of that early web um, uh, setup uh, that I had mentioned before. And um, that's all that I had prepared. Um, I'd like to open it up for any questions. Thank you, Dorothy. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, I have one question that just disappeared. Uh, I can ask it to Dorothy. Great. Uh, Dorothy, would you describe that super cooled addition for the X-ray laser generation that uh, where that shows up on the accelerator model, that half mile new segment? Maybe show a slide of the plot and show where that's located. I, I gather it's parallel to part of the accelerator. Dorothy, I think you're on mute. She's unable to unmute herself. Um, Tom, can you help her? Oh, there it goes. Thank you. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, let me see if I can point you to, um, there's a wonderful website for LCLS2 that helps show, um, let me see if I can share the screen. Can you see this? 
So here um, in the center is a picture of the accelerator. And then the small building here is the cryo plant that's um, built next, and it'll run alongside the accelerator. Does that answer your question? Sorry, did are you able to see the screen? Yes. Oh, great. Yep. Was it Paul? Was were you able to see? Did that answer your question? I think he's on mute too. Oh no. <laughs> Um, well, I just, yeah, LCLS2 has a lot of really engaging content. Uh, there, there are uh, 3D virtual tours and uh, instrument maps, and there's quite a few videos. Um, Slack also has a YouTube channel that I wanted to show you too. Um, they recently came out, our communications group, uh, who does a wonderful job, just came up with an a really neat video here of recent history that talks about the LCLS as well. Um, so I'd really encourage you all to check out our YouTube channel as well. There's a lot of um, insider peeks to the um, the the, the, the LCLS structure and and every all the the things that go on and, and the insider view. <laughs> okay, I have uh, another question for you. <laughs> when was design of Slack started? So uh, in the late 1950s, like around 1956 is when uh, several of the Stanford physicists came together to start planning for the meeting. Um, I want to say that the proposal took over uh, a couple years before um, uh, and a couple iterations as well. And then again, uh, before the final approval and the founding and sign off in 1962. I have one. Uh, I have another question. Um, is there a separate beam dump, uh, aluminum or water, at each detector location, or is there one main beam dump at the facility instead? That's a good question. I need to go back to you. I'm not well versed on the specifics, but I can get back to you on that. Okay. Um, another question was, could you post the URLs you mentioned in the chat here? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, another, uh, the, uh, another question says, I believe the design started in, uh, I think he's referring to Slack in 1950. Can you verify? I know that Panofsky held quite a few meetings in his home uh, with some uh, Stanford physicists. It, it, they might have had some preliminary meetings before 1956, um, but I think um, 1956 is kind of the official um, start date that's recognized, but um, that there might have been conversations that happened before then. Um, uh, the the history is that uh, it started off with um, this, the the mark detectors in uh, sorry uh, the mark accelerators in uh, Stanford. Um, I can we can sorry I'm mumbling a little. We do have um, some resources at uh, on our website that can go in that go into further detail and have uh, links to other resources. And I'll post that in the chat right now. Okay, my um. My parents actually worked at Slack, and that's where they met and got married, and uh, ultimately got married. And um, I know they got married in the early 1950s because my sister, older sister, was born in '53, and they were already married. So my father was the number two employee for Slack after, and so I know it had to have been. And he was a graduate student there at the time, so he actually designed uh, part of the 
you know, the thing that measured the um, electron. Uh, yes. So, so it had to have been earlier. Yes. So, yes, I'm sorry. I need to correct my, um, I, I misspoke. So, yes, there are um, several design and preliminary reports um, from the 1950s. Um, Atron Bloom and Atkinson is the engineering architect construction form, and we have several of the reports on our website that's posted in the chat as well. So yes, you're absolutely right. Um, a lot of the design work started in the 50s. Okay, I have a question. This is Paul Wessling. Um, actually, I introduced San I interviewed Sandra's father, and we have him <laughs> uh, a panel on not so much Slack, but on the Claystron, the development of the Claystron, which yes. her father was involved in. And I used to, when I was a student there in about 64, 65 at Stanford, I used to ride my bike out in the springtime and sit on the berm and watch them doing the construction while I did my homework. But my question is this, there, there was a project proposed probably in the 1980s or 90s to significantly expand the power by increasing the frequency going to another band for the Kleistrons, but it was not funded. Do you have any information on that? Any background on that super uh, slack that was proposed at one point? That does sound familiar, and I'm not uh, well versed on the details, but if you can give me your contact information in the chat, I can um, look that up for and get back to you on that. Sounds good. I'll talk back and forth to you on this. That sounds great. Hey, I don't, I don't see any more questions. There, does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask? I guess uh, uh, just one clarification, um, uh, Dorothy. I had always assumed driving past, you know, driving over the bridge on 280 that the beam tube itself was in that building, you can see, but you, so now you're you're saying, or you're, you said that it was actually buried beneath that building. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, so actually one of the initial designs was uh, in parallel together uh, side by side, but that was um, abandoned for um, uh, the current design, which has the classroom building that you can see on ground, above ground. Um, so the, the linear accelerator is actually 25 feet below ground, um, running in parallel vertically with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, in the Klystron building has um, all the Klystrons in there. You're right. Uh, here's a question for you, Dorothy. Uh -huh. um, I'm familiar with the physics research, but can you eliminate what types of bio research is done? Um, there's quite a bit of research, and I'm, I haven't kept up with everything because there's so much that goes on. But um, in recent memory, um, they did some uh, visualizations of photosynthesis processes, in particular photosynthesis 2. Um, I know they uh, did some modeling with that. And um, I think um, not only the biological processes, but also, or the reactions, but also um, they do a lot of work with um, modeling atomic structures. So a lot of, for example, some of the COVID research or might uh, involve um, modeling uh, receptor sites or the structure on, at an atomic level. So um, in, in a nutshell, that's kind of the flavor of bio research that's done. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I can also uh, see if I can find a quick link. I don't see any new questions yet. Here's one. Uh, so yes. Can you see it's that? It's yes. The, SSRL is coloacted, but is there? Thank you. Sorry, I'm not a good type. I admit. <laughs> uh, but there's also a physical connection to the main Slack team. Oh yes. Um, so the SSRL ring is um, kind of an offshoot of the beam. Um, let me see if I can find a good photo. 
Sorry, I I can me look back in the presentation and see if I have a better image of it. And this year? Um, spear. So bear with me. I came to so, Spain around 1958 and I actually was able to walk through, through the underground hall mm. before it was operational. So here you can see on the left is the ring and then um, to the left of that is the large end station um, A building. And um, it's it's kind of the, the beam is redirected into the research yard and branches off and one of the branches goes to the SSR ring. Oh. Does that, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Looking for any more questions? Like the previous speaker, I was fortunate uh, in that I was able to some group, and I don't recall the group, to take a tour of the linear accelerator. One of the last tours they gave before they actually went operational. And I recall how impressive it was to go into the building there where the uh, tube, you know, above the tube. Uh, the uh, person that gave the tour, and I don't recall who he was, had a great sense of humor. And I recall one of the uh, humorous comments he made was that although the tube is perfectly straight, it's not perfectly level. And he said that's so that if all <laughs> else fails, if all else fails, the electrons will at least roll out the end of the tube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a 20 or 24 inch window for the alignment, I believe. So, um, yeah, it's pretty amazing that over a two mile distance, they can keep it so well aligned. Well, it was put as a single concrete slab. Mm -hmm. I remember that the concrete trucks were coming all the time on Santa Road, you know, to make it longer and longer and longer without any breaks that you see in typical concrete construction. Yes, they did a quite, quite a a lot of work in surveying different sites before they they chose the final site. I, well, I used to live about where the sun is shining over the hill ah. and your face so you <laughs> come by the daily. And I used the, before they had the IBM 75, they actually had an IBM 360 50. Mm -hmm. And I used that to develop at night when I could get on to develop the software that wow. I use at the Stanford Medical Center. Wonderful. By the way, I've just heard that one of the early engineers who worked on Slack and later at CERN, Jan van der Lanz, is in very bad shape and probably mm. won't survive, you know, months. I don't know if any of you know Jan van der Lanz, but he was one of the in engineers at Slack at the time. Here's a question from Pete. It said, when I toured Slack, they said Slack could see battery eons during charging. Is this still oh. going on? That's something I don't know. I can check into that too. I have to confess, I haven't actually been in, in the linear accelerator either. Um, and I would like to someday. <laughs> I don't think it's safe now to be in the no. tunnel itself, right? No, no, no. You have to, it has to be during shutdown. I don't mean the klystron. I don't, mm -hmm. I mean the tunnel below. Yes, yes. Would be radioactive now. Right. Nice. Some people have pictures. I also did want to mention that um, so often the archives receive requests for uh, families or um, whose parents or grandparents have worked at Slack. So we do have um, a photo book of Slack, uh, all Slack staff in a directory. So if you are looking for um, a family member's photo, we would be glad to give that to you. Um, unfortunately, it's um, not the greatest resolution due to the original printing, but um, it's 
it was done professionally or digitized professionally, and we'd be happy to give those to um, to answer any requests for that. Okay. Hello. Hi, Hi. Annette. Yes. Uh, this is Nancy Kirk. Uh, the question is actually, I'm this weekend coming up, I'm going to go see my nephew graduate um, and he will be majoring in astrophysics at Montana State. I would think he'd be quite interested in, in not only learning more about Slack, but actually touring it. I know you said it's not available now, but who would he contact in the future to see if uh, there are tours being given? So there used to be a visitor, um, a tour website with dates and sign up information. Okay. Um, here, I can put the URL in now. Thank you. Um, I, when they do register or when the registration is open, I do want to encourage you to register early because they do fill up pretty fast. I bet. Thank you. Oh, it looks like they have one on the 27th. Um, there, there was a question about what email address do we need to get those photos? Oh, I um, posted that the Slack arc at slack.stanford.edu. I see it. Any other questions for Dorothy? She's doing a great job. Oh, I wanted to thank you all for sharing. It's so wonderful to learn from all of you, too. Well, if I don't see any questions, I'm just going to say thank you very much for um, just giving such a wonderful presentation. I've always wondered. Uh, oh, wait, we have one more question. Paul, there's a hand up. Maybe he's waving. I'm not sure. Um, thumbs up. Okay, good okay. job. So thank you very much for a, a wonderful presentation. Well, thank you. Sorry for all my nerves, but thank you all. I hope it was a good time for you. And th thanks everybody for coming. Bye. And we'll see you um, come to our website and see the recording if you need to have a little fresh look at it again. Thank you very much.